أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمدا عبده ورسوله إن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and guide us and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the time to live till we observe the month of Ramadan at least so we can exit from the month of Ramadan with a clear sin insha'Allah ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the health to be able to fast and increase our worship between Salat, Psalm and doing good things, good deeds in the month of Ramadan which is the, the month of the the best month in the entire year is the month of Ramadan. Actually, in the month of Ramadan, we all uh, recharge our iman, our faith, our spirit, inshallah ta'ala. So I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us the ability to eat, drink, and best of all, to be Muslim, to choose Islam. Because there's a lot of people out there, they can't eat the way they want, they can't drink the way they want, and they can't even follow the path of Islam because they can't be guided because whatever reason they had, they chose not to be Muslim. But Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the ability to be a Muslim, gave us the ability to eat, gave us the health body to drink and eat in halal, inshallah ta'ala, in a lawful way. That's, that's something, one of the few blessings we can just mention. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا if you want to sit down and count how much favor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow on, on you, you don't have enough ink. Even if the entire ocean and water in the world change into ink, and you're going to start and documenting the blessing we are in, we cannot. Because the blessing is not only the money you have in your pocket or in your account, bank account, but actually the time we have to get together, it's a blessing. Uh, you can breathe the air, it's a blessing. You're not sick, it's a blessing. Sometimes sickness, it's more a blessing because when the sickness comes, it brings us close to God. So can we can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by calling him. So everything we have at the time, the children, the, fa the family, uh, the, the security we have in this country, com compare ourselves to what's going on in Ukraine. <laughs> Yeah. So mute yourself. Or... Okay, so it could be a chaos, the country one day, God forbid, just like, you know, Europe now, they have uh, five, three million refugees running from Ukraine or Russia, all the way to our countries. Alhamdulillah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a serenity where we are in our land, right? May Allah keep that peace. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep the serenity in our house, in, fa in our family, in our neighborhood. Amin ya rabbal alameen. But before we enter Ramadan, we mentioned about this topic a little bit before, but we have to remember all of us, we have one enemy and we have to, be, we have to be aware of that enemy so we can conquer the enemy. We can, uh, with the guide of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we can fight that enemy, but the enemy will never leave us alone. And what is that enemy? We talked about uh, this enemy before a little bit. Uh, we called, the father is Iblis. We called who is Iblis, how he became cursed, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kicked him from paradise, right? We did that. But today, the children of Iblis, we call them shayateen, shaitan. So some people don't believe in the devil uh, because they say, oh, the devil is in the human mind. The human spirit sometimes become devilish. It's true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there is a human devil and there is a devil devil. If you do not believe in the devil, it's, it's not good because we have to believe in the devil. The devil exists. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Iblis and his children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he created angels, and the angels don't have children, but each angel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created individually because the, the angels do not produce children. They don't have the desire to get married and have children. But only human being, what we know now, and the devil, the devil also, they produce, they get married, they have male and female, they have desire, they have, they eat, they drink, they sleep, they die, uh, they give birth, uh, 
uh, how we don't know, but that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that's what we believe. And everything we say today, inshallah ta'ala, based on the sunnah. And our guide is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I'm going to start with this hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, be careful about your enemy because your enemy live right here, right here. He put his hand on the nose and he urine in your ears. You might take this lightly or you might take this as a joke, especially if it's the first time you hear about this hadith, this uh, stories from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or you might say, uh, how does that happen physically? You know, you might wonder, but this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. In one hadith, he said, so when you get up early in the morning, the first time you do is you do the, you do the ablution, you take wudu, right? Whether you're going to pray the night prayer or the fajr, the dawn prayer, right? Salat al-fajr. He said, when one of you is tanshaqa, I mean, when you put the water in your nose to wash your nose, he said, uh, make it longer. Take that nose, it's like as if your nose, you want to clean so deep. And then the companion asked him, why that, Ya Rasulullah? Why that at night? Most likely it's not the Zuhr prayer or Asr prayer. Why is that, Ya Rasulullah? He said, because He said, the devil, they sleep. They take a place in your nose here and they sleep here. They don't want you to wake up. So when you're up, when you when you take that wudu, that ablution, when you're washing to prepare yourself for salah, you gotta take that water deep to your nose to make sure that when you niff, you make sure that devil you kicked him out right there as if it's physically there. Subhanallah. That hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Maybe one of us we don't feel it, but that's the truth. So another hadith. A woman came complaining to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in her time. She said, "Ya Rasulullah." I go to my son, I try to wake him up to pray his night prayer. So night prayer here could be the night prayer you pray, you know, tahajjud, qiyam layl, whatever in Arabic you call it, before the dawn. Or some scholar also call dawn is a night prayer because you pray in the dark, right? Dawn, the sun didn't rise yet, salat al-fajr. So it did not rise, the sun did not rise yet. So it could be that salah. She said, when I go to him, he, he, I can't wake him up. I shake him, I tell him, get up. I call him on his nose, uh, on his, uh, you know, face. Uh, you know, he misses, he, he stays sleeping and he misses his night prayer. What should I do? Look what the woman, she said. Uh, the, uh, that's what the woman said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does the Prophet answer? Rajulun, so your son is that man. The devil urine in his ears. Think about it. If you miss Salat al-Fajr, that's the reason. You could not get up because when he urine, literally he urine. And it says, the Hadith says, the human being who they miss their salah, okay, they don't make wudu, they don't wash themselves, that urine, what we don't feel as somebody urinating in my ear, God forbid, you know, we don't feel the water, right? But it says, it leaves, uh, it leaves uh, your body, your body become impure, your body become Time over, you know, time after time after time, you're missing Salat al-Fajr, you don't pray, you don't get up, and, uh, you know, the devil doing this every night, then your body will have, like, contaminated, your, your body become contaminated, it become heavy, it's become, like, you're not light. Think if you're a sister or, a, you know, a family member who they continuously pray Salat al-Fajr on time, and once a while, all of us, subhanAllah, we don't wake up for a reason. How do you feel that day? That happened with me a week ago. I was up till 2.30, I prayed, I read two juz of Quran. It's like, you know, then I looked at the time, Salat al-Fajr, it's 6.30 here in, in Texas. I was like, I can't stay up that late. I went back to sleep. Wallahi, I heard the adhan because my clock called, my, 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 uh, uh, a telephone call and the alarm came and I said, okay, I, I want to get up. I want to get up. I want to get up. What time I opened my eyes? Eight o'clock or not really. Uh, 
this is worse. When the shaitan make you feel worse is I got, I woke up exactly at 7.32, which is the sunrise. It just like it make you crazy. It's like five minutes before I could pray. Now I can't even pray because the sun is rising. You feel bad that day. You feel even the whole day miserable. Even though you get up, you make it up, you do it. May Allah accept it, you know, nobody perfect. But imagine that you do that daily. Then the human being, sometimes you reach the level like, you don't care if you miss it, you don't care because your body is so contaminated. Just like another hadith is about a man who does not go for a Jum'ah prayer for three weeks consecutively. What happened with your heart? Again, literally, physically, we don't know physically if you open up the heart of that person, literally have dots, dot over dot over dot, three black dots. Every Friday, the person missed Salat al-Fajr. This is for men. They do uh, Salat al-Zuhr, uh, Jumu'ah, Jumu'ah prayer. If they don't go to the masjid in purpose, whatever you know the reason, I don't know, they don't pray. Um, then they don't go the following Jumu'ah, then they don't go the following Jumu'ah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they will have a black spot on their heart. That means physically, if you give operation to that person, you're going to see black spots. Maybe not. The heart is a heart, physically organ, right? But subhanAllah, these are spiritual. These are, these are something, uh, the essence of the human being is not physical. So if I say, what is your soul? What is my soul? What is your spirit? What is my spirit? Nobody can hold it, says, this is your spirit, Madiha. It's in your brain. It's in your heart. No, it's in your uh, feet. It's in your, it's everywhere, right? You feel, you touch the pain. You touch the happiness. You feel everywhere. So the, the spirit of your body, uh, it, it's everywhere. It, so the spirit is not something you and me can uh, put our hand on it. So that's how also the devil for us, the shaitan, is not a physical. It's not like I will hold him and kick him out of my house physically, right? I can't do that, subhanAllah. But we have to what? do the precaution. What will prevent that devil to stay in my nose, to urine in my ears? The Prophet وسلم, says, get up for Salat al-Fajr. Then that's what the, you know, the prophet described that your son who missing Salat al-Fajr uh, or the Qiyam lane, imagine the night prayer, so the, the devil urine in his ears. Now he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, why all this happened? What is the evidence in the Quran then? So let's open Surat Al-Isra, Surat Al-Isra, uh, chapter 15, uh, says, A'uzu billahi mishtar rajim. Uh, in the middle of the ayat, number 60 and, and 60, 61, 62, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he created Adam, right? He ordered the angels, and we said that before. Uh, Iblis was in paradise because he was obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When he gave his command to bow down to Adam as out of respect, who refused? You could close it. Who refused? Uh, the devil refused, right? Iblis refused. Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kicked him out from paradise, what did he say? Uh, so if you want to follow us, the ayah number 64, Surah Al-Isra. And Surah Al-Isra, if you want to know what number, I'm going to give it to you right now. Uh, number 17, Surah 17. I'm going to read from 63. قَالَ اذْهَبْ فَمَنْ تَبِعَكَ مِنْهُمْ فَإِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ جَزَاءُكُمْ جَزَاءً مَوْقُورًا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told Iblis when he said, nah, I'm not going to obey you, God. You know, I know I'm not going to bow down to Adam because Adam is, Adam is not in my level. I'm better than him. He said, literally he said, أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِنْهُ I'm better. Just like arrogant, right? We talked a lot about arrogance. Being arrogant is no good. It will take us to hellfire. And that was the first attribute, Iblis. Then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told him, get out from paradise. Our, I'm not, you don't have a chance to stay here anymore. He couldn't say, oh, bite my fingers. I am so sorry, God. Forgive me. Let me make tawbah, repentance, right? Which is Adam did, and Allah forgave him. Hawa did, Allah forgave him. You and me, we make sin. Every time we make sin, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive me, we feel sorry, we cry over our sin, we call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And Allah promised he will forgive us. But he didn't do that. At least he didn't do that. His arrogance lasted to the end. What did he say? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you and whoever followed you, your place is 
hell fire. You will be in the hell fire. What did Iblis said right after that? Well, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, وَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ Try, وَاسْتَفْزِزْ mean here, try to take with you whoever you want, astray whoever you want from the human being. How? With your voice, the double voice. Double voice could be whisperation. It could be a loud, you know, uh, anything we call a loud music, it's not halal music, right? It has bad words, uh, scenery, movie, bad. It has, you know, uh, disrespect uh, parts and scenes, drinking, alcohol, adultery, all the sound we hear, that's the devil way, all are the shaitan way. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And whatever you want to try to bring them, uh, walking to you or riding to you because some people run to the devil and some people take a flight to go to the devil some people take a plane to las vegas to play uh what do you call Qumar, uh, gambling some people take right long trip to commit fornication some people walk some people take vehicle here it says take whatever vehicle let these people take whatever vehicle. And be associate, the shaitan, he told them. You could be associate in their business, in their money, and with their children. And keep promising those people who follow you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say at the end, only the devil promise you fake, uh, fake promises promises he cannot for, uh, fulfill. Like when he promised Adam and Eve in paradise, our parents, when he told them, go near that tree, eat from that tree, that tree will give you shajarat al-khuld, will make you to live forever in a happy, never end your happiness in paradise if you eat from that tree. Allah forbid you to eat from that tree because that tree is forever shajarat al adn You will live forever if you eat from that fruit. Those promises came what? False. Adam and Hawa, they believed and they went and they ate. And the minute they ate, they felt ashamed and it was a false promises. And that's how the shaitan keep promising us false promises, but they never give up. The shaitan never give up on us. They do not try the same. If you never gamble, he will never come to you to tell you, come on, gamble, come on, gamble, because he know you're not gonna gamble. You never committed adultery, he's not going to come through that door because he, he knows you're not going to do it. You never drink alcohol, he knows he's not going to come from that door because that's impossible to make you to do it. The devil give you ideas, tips for things in your weakness. He knows what's your and my weakness. Gossiping, stealing, spying, cheating lying, little things. If it's not major, he can make you do little things. Then you're gonna say, La'anatullah ala shaitan. Angry. Later on, you're gonna see how much anger human being become because of the devil. Make you angry, make you feel envy, jealous, hate for no reason. You hate people, you're envying them. And it, it, it's, a, it's things like come in your moral, things you can do. He knows because you're not going to see a Muslim practicer committing adultery or drinking alcohol or eating pork. Astaghfirullah, I don't eat pork. I eat halal. I'm a Muslim. But meanwhile, it says whoever gossip as if they are putting their dead brother flesh on the table and bite that flesh, dead flesh, immediate brother, dead flesh in their mouth with the blood running from their mouth. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares gossiping. Think sometimes, how many times we gossip, we say, astaghfirullah, I shouldn't, oh my God, don't consider, ya Allah, this is a gossip, I, I, was only, I was only saying something to my friend, you know, to make my chest, oh, I'm so, I have to tell you this, right? That's sometimes how we feel. I gotta tell you something, I gotta tell you something, I can't wait, I saw this, I think, right? Suspicion, inna ba'da Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all the things, the door 
of those little things who find it to interrupt you and give you the whisperation, it's the devil. And if you don't do it, let's say he come to you through gossiping. You don't gossip, he's gonna leave you. He's gonna give you a different idea and a different idea and a different idea. He never give up. Sometimes he give you an idea that you wear hijab, you're better than the one those people who doesn't wear hijab. He make you feel you're superior, a believer. Oh my God, uh, oh my God. I, you know, you feel like I'm, I'm a Muslim, I'm a practitioner, all this kuffar going to hell. How do I know? Maybe this kuffar, what we, I think they're kuffar, maybe they convert one day, they come to Islam and they become better. God forbid, maybe sometimes I feel something, then I go commit sin and I die doing that sin, my ending will be worse than anybody can imagine, right? Isn't it like there's hadith about the two brothers? One was a, like a uh, rabbi, uh, you know, two brothers from Bani Israel. One was like a knowledgeable man, a practicer, and his brother, he, uh, his own brother lived upstairs, but his own brother never pray, never fasted, never come to God, never get up at night to pray. He was a gambling, he had a girlfriend coming to the house. And the downstairs brother will always tell his brother, come on, you know, come back to God, uh, leave all the sin. Come do, then he will tell him, oh, my brother, you're missing Allah. You're praying at night. I'm having party. I'm having people who come sing and go, we drink. You're missing the dunya, right? You're missing all the joy in this dunya. He will make fun on his brother. This is true hadith. And then long, 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 many years passed. Then look at this, it says, the man downstairs, he said, well, my brother always, he talk about his lifestyle and he always tell me that I'm missing. I'm missing so many good things in his lifestyle. I'm gonna try tomorrow. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna do whatever my brother does. If he, if he drink, I'm gonna drink. If he, if he go with a woman, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna see what am I missing in this dunya. I've been praying all these years and fasting. I'm doing whatever Allah asked me to do, right? It says at the same night, the upstairs brother, thinking the opposite. He said, man, my brother was inviting me to do tawbah. I've been sinful, uh, you know, it's it just happy time. But when the happy hour over, I come home, I'm depressed. I'm not too happy with myself. This is enough, I'm getting old. I'm making tawbah, ya Allah, this is my repentant night. I will never, I promise myself, I will never do anything. And by tomorrow morning, I'm gonna go to my brother, I'm gonna tell him, show me, show me how to be a righteous people. At that night, it says the two brothers died. Upstairs brother go to heaven, downstairs brother go to hell. Why? Because this was his intention downstairs. The righteous man's intention was to flip and do all the haram to see how sweet this dunya and what he missing. The upstairs brother, he was feeling sad, feeling sorry, apologizing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give him the chance to live. They did not know they're gonna die that night. Look how they're ended. So that's why we do not judge anybody. And the shaitan can come within us, will tell you, wow, look at you, your salat so good. Wow, look, you did sadaqah, you gave a hundred dollars. That's a lot, my God, you just put a hundred dollars in that box. You're doing charity. Somebody else, what they did, $10 only, oh, I'm better. Anything like that, it come to you, that's become riya. Riya is no I'm in a shirk, associating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a different way that you're showing off yourself. You think you're arrogant, you're bigger, you're more pious than others. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us that only Allah knows what's people's heart, right? What's in the people's mind and hearts. Only Allah knows. Only Allah, your intention and my intention at this night with this gathering. So we cannot say I'm better than you because I pray more or I read Quran in Arabic fluently. You can't, look at you, you can't, right? We can't do that, astaghfirullah. The shaitan can come. Remember the shaitan is our enemy. You could be a righteous, pious woman. He's gonna stay behind you till he cause you slip, slip and you fell into hellfire with him. Tawbah ya Rabbi, astaghfirullah al-Azim. So these ayat really scare me. And then he says, وَشَارِكُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ How the devil can be helping, uh, uh, giving associate with you, with your money. Would he take some money from your bank account? No, but he will make you spend the money in a haram way or earn the money 
in haram way also, either one, because you are responsible, me and you are responsible, how we earn every dollar we have, and where do we spend it? That's a question in the judgment day. Yus'al al-abad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will question us, how did I earn my wealth? Is it a righteous way? If it's not, I am in trouble. And how did I spend my wealth? What did I put my money? Every dime you put it, you are responsible. Be careful. So if you put it on uh, food, you know, supporting yourself, supporting your family in a righteous way, you know yourself and I know myself. But if you're spending somewhere unnecessary, no need, uh, wasting, wasting, that's a waste. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna al those people who they're wasting their wealth in a, in, a, in a way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not happy with it are the brothers and the sister of the shayateen. And that's how shaitan become your association in that wealth. What about the, the children? Look at this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when the man and the wife go to bed without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. They did not mention Allah's names and they're about to enjoy their life, their martial relationship without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It says the devil entered with the man into the woman. So he wants to be a partner with your husband to make a baby. And if that baby come, that baby is touched more than usually touched by the devil because that baby was formed without Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Unlike when the mother of Maryam, peace be upon her, uh, upon her, when she made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh God, you know, give me a child. And if you give me a child, Zawjat Ali Umran, Zawjat Umran, right? She prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she said, Oh God, if you give me a child, I will put this child to serve your house, right? The house of worship. And I want this child to be protected from the devil. So uh, that night, you know, they, they pray and they, uh, that's the adab, the manner of uh, uh, a husband and the wife in their wedding night. In their wedding night, the man supposed to do two ruka'ah and the bride has to be behind him as an imam to do two ruka'ah before he start his first relationship with his wife. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect our children from the devil because that, that child, you will have it, probably, astaghfirullah, uh, we say uh, uh, mal'oon, cursed by the shaitan no. because, because, you know, that, uh, oh, love you. You, you, are you saying something? Yeah. So you see, you see how dangerous. So it says, a man who go to to uh, to bed uh, without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That's how the devil associate with the birth of your child. Sharikum fil awlad. Allahu Akbar. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said during the salah. I mean, you and me, we enter salah, what happened? Oh my God, sometimes I don't know, uh, did I pray three rakah, four rakah? Did I get up, did I, do I have to sit? Uh, I forgot what I read, oh my God, I forgot what, I, right? You go through some whispiration in your prayer or your mind, you're reading, but you're not aware of what you're reading because your mind somewhere else, subhanAllah. So a man came complaining to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam based on hadith. Uh, he said, yeah, yeah, Rasulullah, um, I don't know what happened, you know, when I pray at home, I don't know how many ruka I pray. I don't know if it's three or four. Then I become confused. Sometimes I have to repeat all over and I become, you know, I don't know, I don't know what should I do? So, you know, we know what the Prophet said. Dalika khunzub. Dalika khunzub. What is khunzub? That specific shaitan, specific jinn, his name, Khunzub, his job assigned to the people who pray. He will enter your vein, he will enter your heart, he will come to your, even though you're during the salah. The hadith says, when the human being says, Allahu Akbar, the devil ran away, miles. Then he comes back, never give up, never give up. It's not like somebody, you know, somebody knock your door, you don't open the door three times, four times. They're not gonna keep knocking your door till tomorrow. Even though they know you're home, you're gonna give up and walk away. The devil, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be aware of the enemy. 
He will come back and come back and come back and come back. He will come back. Why are you reading Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Surah Al-Fatiha? Probably you made a mistake. Oh my God, I wasn't aware. I wasn't, I didn't have the full khushua. I didn't have full attention during the salah. Why? The devil come, he tried to take you away. He tried to make me think about Oh, what are you going to do after? Oh my God, I have food on the stove. Oh my God, I don't know. Oh, I got to go to the bathroom. I feel like something pushing me. I got to go to the bathroom. Now I have a gas in my stomach, right? I have a sister who complained to me. She said, really, every time I want to do salah, I feel like the gas can come out. And then I, during the salah, she said, just, I have to break and go to the bathroom and, and some air come out. Then I got to make wudu again, then, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told, also a person who had the same problem. He said, Khunzo, that devil tried to sit on your butt, excuse me, to blow air, to make you feel that you're under pressure to break your salah. If that happened, he said, do not break your salah. Even if the gas come out, do not break your salah because you surrender to the devil and he's going to come back to you. He's going to find that's your weak spot. He's going to come into you through that. Don't even, you know, subhanAllah, I remember sisters used to pray taraweeh with me, wallahi. I remember Imam Qatana, he told her, continue praying because this woman, she had that problem. Every time she feels like she wants to do something and she goes to the bathroom and the gas don't come out. Then she comes back. Then she, uh, some little gas come back. I, I mean, if you're doing taraweeh at a masjid, for example, you know, how many times this woman have to make wudu? We, we took her literally to the imam and it, I explained her because she was so shy to ask this question. He told her, your salah is okay. Continue praying salah even if the gas come out because you're fighting the devil here, literally. That's why subhanAllah, you know, the jinn have a specific uh, devil. And that, uh, as we said, his name Khunzub assigned only to enter your body and my body to give whis a whisperation to us uh, to break our salah or not to fulfill our salah in a fully khushur, subhanallah. This is another story about the devil. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in his place in the masjid, even in the masjid, even the masjid, because you might say the masjid is not a place of the devil. We're praying jama'ah together in the masjid, right? Still the devil, it says, fulfills the space or the devil will take spot between, right? Now with the corona, people don't feel fulfill spaces anymore. <laughs> but in regular salah, how would we, we have to be feet by feet, shoulder by foot, shoulder, right? We have to be like this as a Muslim, not like this when we during the salah jama'ah. So subhanAllah. So uh, in the masjid, the prophet sitting down and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq with him, a man walk in and he sat down and he start attacking verbally Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. We don't know what was his issue. I don't know what was his business, but he starts saying and complaining about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to the prophet. He is no good. He's this, he's that. Accusing him with lie, whatever. And we're talking about Abu Bakr al-Siddiq here. I don't believe anyone will talk bad Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the best friend of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he became later on the first Khalifa of Islam. How can this man come sit and talk so bad about Prophet, uh, uh, about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's best friend? And not only that, his father-in-law also. You should have some manner, right? And while he's attacking Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, Abu Bakr looking at the Prophet's eyes, expecting that the Prophet will defend him, right? You know, I'm, I'm not that person. He's not defending Abu Bakr. He's not saying anything and the man talking and talking. Then Abu Bakr, he reached a level he can't do anymore. So he got up and he said, how could you talk? How could you talk about me all this lie? How could you fabricate the stories about me? And the minute he said that, the Prophet Sallallahu got up and he walked out of the masjid. Then Abu Bakr get more mad. He said, he ran after the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, when the man was attacking me, Talking bad about me, you didn't say anything. You didn't get up, you didn't walk away, you didn't defense me. When I stand, stood up to defense myself, you left with the story. You know what the Prophet said? Sallallahu alayhi wa We learned from the seerah. He said, Ya Abu Bakr, when the man was talking bad about you, ill about you, I was looking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned you specific 
angels came down from heaven to defense you, protect you. You didn't see them. You're going to have to see them. Also, you have to believe in the angels. When you got up to defense yourself, to defend, to defense yourself, the devil walked in to make you angry, to be that the fight now, the fight may be from verbal to physical, right? The devil came to push you. He said, me and the devil, we cannot stay in one room. That was the reason I left. You know how bad he felt, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq? You know what we learned from the story? Today, subhanAllah, it's the opposite. Imagine you're in the masjid, let's say, let's say, scenario, two brothers fighting, not physically, verbally. What do we do? What did he say? Oh my God, oh my God, come on, come on, come on. What's the fault? Oh, you're outside, come, come, come. There's a fight, right? We want to be part of that. We want to watch. We want to see who's right, who's wrong, who's, who's the winner. If it's a fist fight, it's the opposite. Imagine people fighting on the street, fist fight, right? People come and they watch. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 hey, him, hey, him, right? Somebody decide this, somebody decide that, then it become more and more. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, when there is a fight, there is always devil between them. That is al-ghadab. Ghadab is the anger. And the anger become more because the devil come into your heart and my heart and he put flame. And that flame he put in our heart, it become flame, burning flame. Make you get up. If you're angry, you're sitting down. What do you do? You get up and you, you shout. You raise your voice. Your face become red, right? Your eyes become what? Popping out. Watch somebody who's angry. It could be your husband. It could be the wife. It could be your children. It could be anybody, right? They're scary. Sometimes, you know, uh, kids, when they, one time we took a picture of my grandson, he was very angry. Uh, you know, I videotaped him. Later on, later on, then when I made him watch, he goes, oh my God, Titi, I was so scared. That was not me. That was not me. <laughs> because you don't see yourself. You think you're powerful that moment. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لَيْسَ الشَّدِيدُ بِالصَّرْعَةِ It's not the tough person, the one who can scream and fight and shout more. That's sara. You're gonna def you're gonna be def you, you know you're gonna defeat your uh, uh, the other person, right? But he said in the masjidi do the strong man, the strong person is the one yumsiku nafsahu and al ghadab is the one who control their anger, because controlling anger will take more patient than just outrage and fight. You push the table. Table, you turn the table upside down. I did one time. I'm guilty. <laughs> we were married. <laughs> I remind my husband many times. I don't know what happened. We were married maybe in a few months or something. I don't know. My husband walked in the kitchen, the dining table. We didn't have that fancy fancy anyway. Whatever broke was, you know, from secondhand store. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. We had cups and dishes. I don't know what happened. I was so angry. I turned. <laughs> the table upside down. <laughs> he was cleaning after me. I didn't clean. I ran to another place and I sat down like a, what they call it, cats, right? Uh, Subhanallah. You know, sometimes that's why uh, my mom and my father, uh, my parents lived together 65 years happily. And we are 10 siblings, alhamdulillah. And my parents grew up in a village. Uh, imagine how much work they had. Uh, they grew up in a farm. We had gray plant land farm, a huge farms with fig tree. We have cow, we have chicken, we have gardening. Uh, we didn't have running water. We didn't have electricity like now. Imagine my parents live like this in Golan Heights. It doesn't know me. I grew up in Golan Heights. But later on, you know, the war happened. But after my mom gave all her birth, all the children in that village, that's when we became refuge to Damascus, 1967. But my parents, if my, uh, you know, I'm in the middle, I'm not the youngest, I'm not the oldest. So subhanAllah, uh, we grew up, we start, you know, watching our parents' behavior, right? You learn from them. And um, I used to tell my mom, my God, you know, when my father angry and he says something, my mom will sit in one corner and she will not. She will literally laugh. And sometimes my father used to get more mad because, oh, here you go, your mom. She's laughing. And I'm a serious about this problem, whatever problem he's talking about. Now, after a few days, my mom is angry. She says something, you know, life, 
does many things to make you angry. She's saying something. My father will walk around laughing and he will shake my shoulder. May Allah's mercy on them. Shake my shoulder. He says, Madih, look at your mom. Look at her when she's angry. She's not pretty. <laughs> then he will laugh. Then my mom, when they come down, both will laugh. Wallahi, they live 65 years happily. I mean, that's many years for a husband and wife and it was a hardship life, you know. It wasn't, it, you know, it, it wasn't poverty, but it was a lot of work. Being a farmer, it's a lot of work. With no help, they didn't have like, you know, my father would never uh, hire people to do chicken work, collecting the eggs or, or taking care of the cow, no. Daytime, somebody would take care of the cow, but at night when the cow come back, you gotta milk them. You cannot leave the milk alone. You're gonna make a cheese, yogurt, butter. We lived in a village, sister. It's not like today's technology. We didn't have refrigerator. If you don't use in summer that milk for two or three days, that milk will become sour and we throw it. Even though we lived happily. We li That's why me and my sister, my brother, we are very close. Nothing we can, nothing on earth will separate us. Nothing. Nothing. We will never fight over anything, me and my brothers and my sister. Some of us died, you know, we're, we're now six uh, from the 10 or five, subhanAllah. But my point is uh, uh, the anger, sometimes the husband and the wife will make the man say, you're divorced. Later on, he'll say, oh, what did I do? I shouldn't say that. I didn't mean to divorce you. Who I'm going to call now? I'm going to call the imam. What is the rules of divorcing? I was angry, right? If you can't control yourself, you're not a tough guy. It's not the one who defeated the other with their verbal. Somebody curse you, you curse back. Somebody curse you, you curse them twice. Somebody said your mother, now you say your mother and your father and your wife, right? And the Prophet وسلم, in another hadith, he said, لا يلعن أحدكم أباه. He goes, one of you never, should never curse their own parents. And the companion were like, really? Who would curse their own parents, Ya Rasulullah? He goes, when you curse somebody else's parents, what do you do? You bring cares to your parents because they're gonna curse you back. Most of the people says I by I, right? You curse me, I curse you back. No, uh, people don't forgive. The people who forgive are gotta be humble. It, it gotta be in, in a different category. It gotta be like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who learn later on how to forgive. How not to get angry, even if they, when they accused his own daughter Aisha by fornication, and he was giving a money, sadaqa, charity, a welfare to the person who came up with the, who spread the news in the city of Medina. He lived under the welfare of Abi Bakr al Siddiq. He didn't even stop paying him, even though he accused his own daughter, which is a wife, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his beloved wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, right? He didn't even stop giving them the welfare because he said, I'm doing good things for goodness. If that person is bad, I'm still, I'm taking care of them financially. I will continue taking care of them. Nothing to do with what they say. So you do not treat people eye by eye, even though sometimes it's your right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described those Worshipper, Ibadu Rahman, the people who worship Ar Rahman, the merciful, those people, the slave of Allah, the servant of Allah, are the best when they forgive people at the time you can take revenge. That takes a lot of moral, a lot of good behavior for the sake of Allah, only for the sake of Allah. Forgive for the sake of Allah and make dua for them to be guided. Those people who you think they're you hate them, they're your enemy, they took your right. Somebody say, might say, she took my husband, right? Some people go after married men, some people go after married women, and they give promises, if you get divorced from your husband, I'll marry you. Imagine, Muslim society, well, because Muslim society is not an angel society. We have good, we have bad. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those people have to be what? We all have to be what? Do not allow the shaitan. Shaitan will cause a separation. 
a separation between wife and husband. And Iblis says, my best soldiers are the soldiers of the shayateen who can fully, fully divorce a married Muslim family. Once that Muslim family get divorced, that shaitan comes back to Iblis. You know what Iblis says? Sit down on my left side. You are uh, my higher, the high, you achieve the most highest job I can assign you to separate between husband and wife. And that's in Surah Al-Baqarah. To separate between husband and wife, it's a very big sin. If you become part of that, it's a very big sin. You know, cancellation, bring them back together. We, we don't say divorce is bad. There is a reason for divorce. But if there is no reason, just fuzzy and gossip. And he said, I said, you said, my money, your money, you fight over dunya materialistic. It's better to have a patient and to take that pain for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe with your patient and my patient, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up door, door of faraj, we call it, door of success. Happy, happy doors, happy doors can come. If it's not from the husband, maybe the child you have from this man will be the best. You know, we know that a Sahabi, uh, he was Tabi'in actually, married this a pious woman, but this pious woman, she was really in her figure, Allahu alam, she was not that pretty. So when the man married her, uh, he later on felt bad. Uh, he wants to leave her. But he didn't divorce her. He told her, I'm going to go for a trip. I'm going to travel. I'm going to leave the city of Medina. I'm going to go. I don't know when I'm going to come back. I cannot promise you. Because the woman felt that her husband really not happy with her. You know what she told him? She told him, Asa an tikrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum. It's from the Quran. Don't hate something. It could be good things come from it. So he said, okay, but he left. When the man left, the woman was pregnant. He didn't know. She went through nine months, no husband, nobody came back, nobody knocked the door. She gave the baby birth. She took care of the baby. The baby became a child. She sent him to Islamic school. She sent him to the best teachers in the city of Medina. He became Malik. Um, Anas bin Malik, Malik bin Anas, one of the top scholars in the city of Medina. While he's sitting in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let's say 22 years passed, because he's a young man now. He's sitting in a minbar doing khutbah after salat. This man, who's supposed to be his father, came back from his trip. He enters the masjid to pray. When he finished praying, he found that the circle happening and somebody's talking. He sit down and he listen. He doesn't know who's talking. When he, while he was talking, he asked somebody next to him, he goes, this person who's talking have a great knowledge. Who is he? He told him, this is Malik bin Anas. You don't even know this guy. Where are you from? He goes, mm, uh, I'm a traveler. I come from out the city of this Medina. I'm a stranger. He goes, oh my God, he is, he's, he's one of the best teachers and faqih in the city of Medina. He said, okay. Later on, when everything's finished, he goes to his own house. He knows where does his wife live. He did not see her for all the years. He doesn't know what to expect, but he knew now. He doesn't know, this son is having his own name, his Anas, that's Malik, could be his son, could be not. He goes and he knocks the door. Who opened the door? The same scholar who was standing on the member talking after Salah. And he looked at him and he said, who are you, you stranger? He goes, oh, I just heard your dars, your lesson. I was listening to you in the masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What a great lesson you were giving. He goes, is your mother home? He goes, yeah, my mother home, but no strange man will come and ask about my mom. I mean, my mom is a pious woman. Who are you? He goes, go tell her. Asa and takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayran lakum. 
He reminded her with the last sentences she told him, don't hate something, maybe good things come out of. She heard that, you know what she said the woman? Son, that's your father. Go bring him in. He came in and they went back together. Because I told you, look what Allah gave it to us, a pious son. Look at this woman, first of all, as example. Any one of us get pregnant for a man, a man and the man disappear of your life, what do you do? You and me, what would we do? I'm no better than you. What would we do? My God, after, of course, I have to give a birth. After that, I'm going to go to court. Oh, the man is not coming back. He's not sending me any welfare. How I'm going to do this? Oh, my God. Get divorced. Legally, you can get divorced. This woman, if she seeks a divorce, any imam will give her divorce. Her, her own son will give her divorce. Your husband, we don't know if he's alive or not. After six months, if you do not hear Islamically from your husband, you do not receive help from him. After six months, a woman can request from the imam to be divorced. Then the imam maybe will tell her, let's wait one year. If nothing, no money coming, no news, no nothing. Even if he's alive, we don't know. Life, dead, we don't know. So you have a right to get divorced. Did this woman do that? No. How much patience she had. That means all her life was for Allah only, not for a man who left her. Her, her life, she was very happy. Then she did her best to teach, to put all her money, income she made working as a single woman to support her own son to become a scholar. And she did. How many women we need like this today to be really doing her best, our best, to produce children who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who they become scholars, who they will defend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this beautiful religion without getting angry. That, that woman didn't have any room for the devil in her lifetime. No room. She did not allow the devil to come in her life at all. Subhanallah. We have a many examples like this from the seerah, Sirat al-Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we'll continue about the hadith. He said, if the human being enter their house, you have to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Because if you do not say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim while you're coming back in your house, the shaitan walk with you and he says, oh, I have a house, I have a place. Then you sit down to eat. If you do not say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim to eat, the shaitan says, wow, I have food to eat. You go to sleep. If you don't say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim when you put your head on the pillow, the shaitan says, wow, I have bed to sleep. I am so blessed, he will say. I have house, I have food, I have bed to sleep. He will sleep next to you. Allahu Akbar. That's what the shaitan. Then he say, when the human being sleep without saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the devil come in the head, يَعْقِدُ الشَّيْطَانُ عِنْدَمَا يَنَامُ Three tie. He will tie something on top of your head three times. You will untie the first one when you are turning and tossing at night, when your consciousness awake and you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rahim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Remembrance of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If you can't do that, you just did untie the first one. Imagine, you just did untie the first one. I'm going to see what's on my Aisha. Yeah, I get a pray. That, subhanallah, that's what I say. If you get up and make wudu at that night, and then you untie the second one, what, there was a devil tie on the top of your head. And the third one, when you go up and you pray your dawn prayer or your salat al qiyam al or two ruka'ah, so the shaitan will run away from your window screaming and crying. And that's why it says, do not surrender to the devil. Do not. You have to read Ayat al-Kursi. If you did not memorize Ayat al-Kursi yet, you have to memorize it. If not, write it on a piece of paper and please read it before you sleep. And I'm going to tell you right after I come back from Salat al-Maghrib, uh, what is the benefit of reading uh, um, Ayat al-Kursi? Can I do that? Okay. I go. Sorry. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so we said, mm -hmm. uh, how 
That's why, inshallah ta'ala, if anyone of us, I'm, I'm available, sisters, I'm available. Anyone of us who wants to review the suwar, you know them, or Ayatul Kursi, you want to practice, please call me daytime. Text me, say, you know, I want to review this ayah, the surah with you. If you don't memorize it, let it play on the audio. You know, let it just put it on YouTube, Ayatul Kursi. Read it before you sleep. Before uh, I know it's over one hour now. I'm going to tell you this one hadith about Abi Hurairah. And after that, inshallah, we will know the power the devil have over us unless we do what we're supposed to do based on the sunnah. Based on the Quran, uh, you know, guide us. The Prophet وسلم, guide us because uh, the whole life around you is a devilish life. They don't care. They don't talk about it. Why? Because they really fulfill what the devil wants. All the haram out there, drinking, whining, music, uh, loud, cheating, uh, stealing husband, wife from each other and uh, funny kid. Uh, name it. It's, uh, what else? Uh, you know, uh, Men become women, women become men, and same sex relationship. And name it, it's there. It's there. It's a very, very bad time we live in. Every turn, every way you turn your face, even if you're an, you know, the only one maybe WhatsApp, unless you don't get uh, any haram thing from WhatsApp. If you go to YouTube or you go to Instagram, any Facebook pop up all this haram, and your email pop up some images sometimes. You don't want to have it, right? So subhanAllah, that's why we have to be careful. We have to always say, A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Rajim. Because when, when the people fight, if one of them says, A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Rajim, it will come down. That's how the devil ran away. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. And it says, if the people fight, they cannot come down. You cannot come down. Like I wish sometimes, you know, when you make sin, you make mistakes, you break rules, you say, I wish I knew back then. When I turn the table, you know, upside down in front of my husband when, you know, 30 some years ago, I wish I knew that, astaghfirullah, yani, I didn't have all the knowledge, you know, sometimes you have, right? That time it says, if you're that angry, go ahead and wash yourself with cold water. Make wudu. It, just splashing cold water with, on your face cool you off because the devil make you boil, right? <laughs> so, subhanAllah, Adab al Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, if somebody stand up and you get mad, sit down. If you're sitting down, it even says lay down. If it doesn't work, go wash, go make wudu. SubhanAllah, I didn't tell you how my parents, uh, later on when we became older, I used to tell my mom, when my husband is angry, you laugh. When you're angry, he laughs. What's the story? He goes, in our beginning of our marriage, we agree that we cannot both get angry at the same time. If one of us angry, let give them all the freedom to talk whatever they want to say. Yeah. And you sit down and you listen or you laugh the way they do. And based on that, they didn't fight face to face. They didn't. They didn't. One is fighting, the other one's laughing, walking around. It worked. It worked in their marriage. Later on, I learned, you know, we all have, you know, if you have a husband, hey, nobody's life is, is happy time. Once upon a time, uh, uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, one of his wife, she shouted to his face. He goes, my God, you're shouting in my face when we lived in Mecca, the woman was a different. Women will oh, respect God. dearly their husband. How come you could shout yeah. in, 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 in my face? You know what he said? She said, she said, Ya Omar, your own sister shout to the face of her husband, which is a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, that will never happen. My sister will never, never shout to her husband's face, which is a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She said, go, go and listen. And he came, Amr al Khattab, he came and he, you know, once upon a time, he saw that his sister was standing up and she was yelling at the prophet, whatever it is, right? And he goes, Ya Rasulullah, I just came to tell you that my wife scream at my face sometimes. And I find out that my sister does the same to you. You know what the Prophet says? Ya Omar, we, they, they have all the right to fight, to scream, to shout. They're the one who bear our children. Look at the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're the one who do our housework. They're the one who worry about us when we are outside. They're the one who take care of everything in this house. They have right to complain. We just have to sit and listen to them. And then he said, the women in the city of Medina are different. They're city women. The city woman is different than the people in the Bedouin 
where the man will go do whatever they want to do. And when they come back, the woman will always give her salutation to her husband out of respect. That's her job. If a woman break that, wow, then her entire tribe become ashamed about the daughter's behavior, disrespecting her husband, good, bad. That's how, you know, cultural, cultural things. But when, even though Islam says the same, but when you live in a city where just like us now, we all live in a city, you, you watch the soap opera, you watch the news, you see this man, how he, you know, talks so sweet to his wife, then you, your husband come home, he's not saying any sweet talk to you, you're going to get mad, you're going to say, oh, you're not like those movie stars who they talk sweet to their wives <laughs> only on the in the front of the camera right <laughs> so subhanallah that's why the living in the city is a big difference so once upon a time the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he assigned abi huraira you know everybody knows abi huraira one of his uh, um, best uh, companion who will uh, pass the stories of rasulullah a hadith of rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam later on but in that time he assigned abi huraira to guard the Baytul Mal. Baytul Mal means like the bank of the city of Medina. Whatever wealth came into the, uh, you know, in the Prophet Sallallahu because he was a government, right? So he put it in one room and he assigned Abi Huraira since he wasn't married. He said, you're gonna be in that house, in that room. At night, you're gonna be careful. Maybe a thief will come, maybe somebody will come. So you, you're gonna be brave enough to protect and guard the wealth of the believers, right? Baytul Mal, call it. He said, yes. And that night, he said, Abi Huraira, while he lay down, he's sleeping, he heard he heard something like somebody's touching. He didn't hear, he didn't hear neither door open or somebody break uh, through a window, but he, He's hearing like as if somebody in the room with him. He opened his eyes, he saw a man standing and his head in that bags was all the money and the coin there. And he jumped on him and he catched his hand. He said, what are you doing? I will kill you right now. Oh my God, how did you walk in? I don't see the door open, I don't see the window open. So the man said, oh, please, please. I, I'm a traveler and um, I was very, you know, I didn't have any money. I didn't know anybody in the city. I figured, you know, let me just steal a few coins just to buy my food. That's it. I'm very hungry. So Abu Huraira felt sorry for this man. And he promised him he's not going to come back just tonight. Give me something. So he didn't give him any. He told him, I can't give you anything. This is not my money. Come in the morning to the message and I will speak to the prophet. And if he allow you to have some, you, you will have some. He said, okay, and the man left. When the man left, uh, Abi Huraira came to the message and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, oh, looks like yeah, Abi Huraira, you had a visitor last night. He said, yeah, Rasulullah, yeah. A man came in, I don't know how, but he promised he's not gonna come back, but he complained that he's poor, he needed money. Probably he's gonna come to the message in the morning to ask for some help. And the prophet said, no, 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 no. I know he's gonna come back tonight to you. He's not gonna come here. Abi Huraira, peace be upon him. He comes back the second night while he's sleeping. Same story. He hears something, he opens his eyes. He sees the same man standing and trying to take in money. Now he's begging more. He goes, I told you I'm not gonna come back, but believe me, when I left my children crying, my wife crying, we don't have food, we're a traveler. We just broke down somewhere and we're just waiting, but we need some food for ourselves. He catched his hand. He said, you're a liar, you're a liar. I'm gonna take you to the prophet. He begged him. He said, no, 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 don't take me. I will be so embarrassed. Let me go, I'm not gonna come back. He let him go. The third night, the prophet told him also, he's gonna come back. The third night he comes back. And now when he comes back, the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, Abi Huraira, he said, no, 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 I'm not letting let, let you go because you lied to me twice. You said you're not gonna come back, you came back. I'm gonna take you, I'm gonna tie you, I'm gonna wait till Fajr when the dawn prayer come, I'm gonna take you to the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whatever he's gonna do with you, he will do it with you. You're lying, you're, you're lying. I, I, that's all. And then this man begged Abi Huraira. He said, don't take me to the prophet. Now the devil know how to get into each one of us, right? That's what we said. He know Abu Bakr, uh, Abi Huraira, 
does not work for the Prophet ﷺ for any reward, for any money, for any salary. Maybe sometimes he eat food, his dinner plate, that's, that's all his price. He's not like a student of knowledge who got paid, right? No. He do it for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he said, you love knowledge, right? Abi Huraira, Abi Huraira said, yes. He said, I'll teach you something from the entire holy book you have. I'll teach you something. If you read it before you go to sleep, you will never see my face again. Abu Huraira, and he said, teach me. He goes, no, you gotta promise me. You're gonna let me go if I teach you. He said, I'll promise. Let me learn something from you, then I'll tell the prophet, right? I promise I'll let you go. The devil said, the devil, he's a devil. The man said, the man said, before you go to sleep, read Ayatul Kursi. That surah, that ayah in Surah Al Baqarah 255. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al hayyul qayyum. If you read the ayat al Kursi, he said, Know me, nothing like me. I am the devil. I'm coming to you as a human being. No one will can come to you if you read the ayah. Just let me go. So he let him go. Now Abu, Bak Abu Huraira come to Rasulullah in the morning. He said, what did the man say? Ya, 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 Abu Huraira, I told you he's going to come back the third night. He said, he came back here, Rasulullah. Wallahi, I tied his hand. I tied his leg. I was going to bring it to him. But he told me that he's going to teach me, teach me something I don't know. I let him go. He told me, read Ayat al-Kursi every night. He will never come back again. You know what he said, the Prophet? Sadaqa wa huwa kathub. He said the truth. Daka shaitan. He came to you as a human being. He's a liar. He always deceives a human being. But at this one time, he told you the truth. That's the power of Ayat al Kursi. When you read Ayat al Kursi, the devil, no place to urine in your ears, to sleep in your khayshum, we call it, in your nose. No place, inshallah ta'ala. And of course, besides Surah uh, uh, beside the uh, Ayat al Kursi, uh, I don't want to take all your time tonight. Uh, next time we meet, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk the power of Surah Al Baqarah. Please, 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 if you cannot read it, read it in Arabic, make the cassette, make the audio play, YouTube play in Surah Al Baqarah in your house at least, at least once a week. Because Surah Al-Baqarah will kick the devil out of your household for 40 days. Imagine you play with it, you play or you read it once a week. The companions, some of them, they will read it daily. Surah Al-Baqarah, two and a half chapter. It's a little bit long. It's the longest of the Quran, but it's doable. For, for me, it take me, uh, um, each just it take me 20 minutes. So it take me, uh, Less than an hour or one hour if I want to read it a little bit fast. Right? So subhanAllah, you could read it part by part in a day time, or you could make the cassette play in the house. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me if I made anything wrong. It's from me, anything right from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with a few days left from Sha'ban and to enter Ramadan and accept our fasting. Uh, from me, from my beloved sister. I love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, we, Allah gave us the opportunity to be together. Somebody else can't be here for whatever reason or can't be in a masjid today for any other reason. It's just gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who allow us to be together at this precious moment. Thank you, Allah, and love you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to stop.